Thank you, thank you. Hey, I'm Niwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Port Over, which is Barnes and Noble's podcast. I'm delighted to see all of you because I can actually see your names in the panel next to my screen. And Shannon DeVito, director of books at Barnes and Noble. And of course, the woman of the hour, Sarah Addison Allen, who broke all of our hearts a million times over. And we are going to talk about all of the things that broke our hearts a million times over because I've been dying to have this conversation. If you heard my colleague, Alison Gavlitz, who sat in for me as a guest host of Port Over, she did a fabulous interview with Sarah back in early September when the book came out. We're very excited. So you can always go back and listen to that because guess what? We are going heavy on the spoilers in this event. So I just want to warn you now, there's other housekeeping to come, but there will be spoilers in this conversation because Sarah, I have a couple of biggies for you towards the end. I will say they'll come towards the end. Um, housekeeping though, we have your questions. If you registered a question when you signed up for Eventbrite, we have those. I will be asking them as we go along through this event. But if you'd like to use the Q&A module at the bottom of your screen, just run your mouse up and you'll see the Q&A module. You can put that your questions in there and anyone else can upvote them, downvote them, whatever. We can all participate, which is kind of fun. You can also drop your questions in the chat. I'm monitoring both. I can, I can do lots of things on the screen and I'm so delighted to see you women. But before we get too far into things, Shannon, I know why you picked other birds for the BNN book club. I know exactly why you chose it, but why don't we share that with all of the folks who are joining us here today? So Sarah, I've always loved your work. So I, I can't tell you how excited I am for this discussion just on a personal level, but this really, when I read it, that it, it is a sparkling gem of a novel. It charmed me, the character stories. I fell in love with each one for a different reason. There's the thread of mystery throughout. It's haunting and exhilarating and tackles questions like grief, but also found family and love. And I just, it's book club catnip. So I thought it was perfect for the month of September and it's ripe for discussion. So that is, that is why I had to, had to have it for book club. Oh, I love that book club catnip. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about how this novel started for you. Let's just, let's talk about the setting. Let's talk about this cat. I love this cast as much as Shannon does, but let's start with place because Mallow Island is as much a character in this book as your actual people. It's true. And I always start with a sense of place. I, you know, I am, I, I write by the seat of my pants. I'm not a plotter. So um, I, but I always, always have a sense of place. And when I first started uh, writing uh, what would become other birds, it was the idea of, I wanted to go to the coast. And because mm -hmm. my family and I, uh, when I was a kid, we always vacationed to the South Carolina coast, mm -hmm. never went to the North Carolina coast, although, you know, we live in North Carolina. So I have very good memories of the South Carolina coast. And so it, it started from there. I thought at first, maybe I was going to uh, set it in Charleston. I was maybe going to make it my first book set in a real place, but that quickly nixed that idea because there's a certain veracity you have to ha have when you, you know, when you're in a real place. And I like being able to make up my own rules in my, in my own places. So that's how Mallow Island uh, mm -hmm. formed. Okay. And Anastasia, uh, who registered her question with Eventbrite is wondering why the title other birds, other birds that came fairly late in the process. Um, I wrote the book under the title, the truth in stories. And that wasn't very catchy. So I had to, uh, and the process of coming up with a new title was, you know, hundreds and hundreds of titles trying to find what would work. Other Birds was actually the name of, um, okay, in Other Birds, there is, mm. a, there is a book called Sweet Mallow. <laughs> and it's written yeah. by, a, by a character who is an author and it's his, mm -hmm. his famous book. And um, there's a character called Henry Sparrow. And his, his name at first was Henry Otherbird, because I thought it sounded like a very Flannery O'Connor kind of name. Mm -hmm. And I kept mm -hmm. going back to that other bird, other bird, but I couldn't have the book named after a fictional character within the fictional book. So I actually changed Henry Otherbird's name, took other birds out of that context. And that was the title. And it ended up gelling a lot of truths in the book of mm -hmm. found family of fitting in, you know, finding your flock, that kind of thing. And we will cover all of that, <laughs> I promise you. Okay, so let's just set it up. We know everyone's read the book, but Zoe, our dear, lovely, lovely girl, Zoe. I love this kid. 
I really love this kid. And man, her dad, he needs <clears throat> a lesson in dadding. He is not a good dad. He's just not a good dad. But Zoe, now did Zoe show up first or did Zoe show up as part of it? Because this really, the way your characters hang together in the narrative is so cohesive. I kind of feel like they all showed up at the same time. She was the first character okay. I came up with and everyone else fell into place. And as it is with every mm -hmm. book I've written, I think I have a main character, but the secondary characters rise up to be main characters. <laughs> so that it, it ends up being an ensemble. Nearly every book I've written has been that way. But I started out with Zoe and I thought, OK, here is this this young woman out on her own for the first time. Um, and that was that was her journey to Mallow Island. And I wanted mm -hmm. it to be set in um in a sort of an encapsulated condo setting where mm -hmm. you know these characters who would never have had anything to do with each other otherwise um had uh, were forced together and so she she actually guides them into coming together and, and mm -hmm. healing but um the other character stories became as important as zoe's mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. end of the book shannon do you have a favorite character so am I allowed to have two? <laughs> yes, of course. Um, <laughs> what? So, How is I that know. a question? <laughs> <laughs> so Lisbeth for me, just because she's so curmudgeonly, like sometimes my favorite character is not someone I can necessarily relate to in the biggest way, but someone I just love to hear from and someone who I just want to know more and kind of dig into it. Um, so <laughs> I just, she just, I just loved her. Um, and then Pigeon. Um, and the, the chapter from Pigeon's perspective, I just like it broke my heart in the best possible way, crying happy tears. So um, <laughs> those, you know, I love Zoe. There's so many, I, I'll, there's so many characters that you can gravitate towards for different reasons. But mm -hmm. those, those were kind of standouts for me. Um, Sarah, did you have a favorite of your, of your <laughs> darling? <laughs> I was wondering if because those two characters sung to you so much is because the ghost stories are told are the only parts of the book that are told from first person. And so it's more immediate. And it's sometimes they're, the ghosts are even talking, you know, breaking that fourth wall and talking to the to the reader themselves. So sometimes I wonder if if people who have read the book, um, are they more closely connected to the ghosts because the ghosts are first person because the ghosts speak to them as, sure. the to the as much as the ghosts. Yeah, as much as I really like Zoe, though, Fraser's my guy. Uh, Fraser. So the minute you introduced Fraser, I was like, who is this dude? Who is this dude? What's his connection? Where is he going? And I have to say, I laughed when you dropped that line about Fraser's jammies. Oh, yeah. His pajama. I was screaming. I was laughing so hard. I was like, of course, this makes perfect sense. But I mean, sorry, monogram pajamas. That's a really nice touch. So cool. let's talk about the details for a second, because you've got this cast, right? You've got Elizabeth and her sister Lucy, and you've got Charlotte, and you've got Mac, and everyone has their stories. We meet Oliver a little later. Obviously, Fraser's my guy. Zoe, Zoe, and her messy, messy family. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about details for a second, because we've got the Della Wisps, which there are lots of questions, honestly, from the Eventbrite crew saying, are these based on real birds? Where did the idea come from? Let's, so let's talk about the birds in conjunction, though, with the people, because I don't think you can separate the two. That's true. I, I um, Well, the, first of all, the Della Wisps are completely made up. I, I, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to make them in as annoying as possible and almost sentient and you know with their their, their own personalities but i needed to make them up i couldn't I, because there's only so much you can stretch the truth you know even mm -hmm. in magical realism so um the Della Wisps are a made-up breed um but the whole idea of birds sort of wound its way through the book in ways as i was writing it i was i was deliberately putting in easter eggs um sort of this light mm -hmm. motif of there, there are instances of birds in which birds are used to describe a sensation or, mm -hmm. and I, I deliberately did that because I, 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 and I didn't want to hit people over the head with it, but there are Easter eggs in there that if, mm -hmm. if you happen to revisit the book sometime, you take out the highlighter going, oh, well, there's it, there's it, there it is again. There, there are a lot mm -hmm. of bird references that, that don't actually have anything to do with actual birds, but mm -hmm. um, I liked playing and at, with that, with the, um, I don't know the, the the context and the theme of other birds and I I really think it helped the book gel 
more mm -hmm. um, once I had that in mind, that that was a theme running through the book. Well, also the way Pigeon was sort of having a moment with the Delawis, I was, I wanted to see how that was going to play out because, I mean, Pigeon, Pigeon can be a handful. <laughs> she, she can, she absolutely can. And um, she was not in the first draft of the book. Mm -hmm. um, Zoe did not have an invisible bird in the, in the first mm -hmm. draft of the book, but um, at, uh, at some point writing the book, I, I once I realized all the characters were haunted in some way, that it started with Mac when I realized that Mac had a ghost. Um, I realized or wanted maybe something that would be bonding to these characters, but they were all haunted in some way by something. Maybe not necessarily ghosts, but also their pasts or, or something like that. But Pigeon, I knew probably halfway through the book. I didn't know when I first inserted her into the book. I thought I was just going to um, have Zoe grow up and let go of her imaginary pigeon. And, but mm -hmm. I realized about halfway through the book that pigeon was, can I do this spoiler? Is it? Okay? Oh, yes, we can. Cause we warned people, we warned people that spoilers were coming. Cause also there is, um, Alan, uh, no, excuse me. Jennifer Meyer really is dying to know if you knew the ending oh, as you were writing other birds. So yeah, I think it would be a good time not. to drop that question. Yeah. In half halfway through the the book when um i realized that zoe's invisible bird is not just an imaginary friend it's her the ghost of her mother mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so um i i knew from that point on that i was heading toward that ending and i knew exactly how i was going to end this book you know and we've been talking about sort of other birds as the overarching theme but we got to talk about mamas and we got to talk about ghosts right. because otherwise we're missing out on the big beating heart of your book. I mean, and mm, we all have mamas. I happen to be very fond of mine. And mamas and ghosts. Oh, Sarah, what have you done to our hearts, lady? <laughs> what have you done? Let's talk about this for a second. You knew, I mean, there's also a little bit of personal backstory to this part of the book as well. So can we, there are a couple of folks who are asking sort of, hey, how did we get here? Right, right. Well, yeah, I, I've, um... I dedicate the book to my mom and in, in the in the acknowledgments, um, I, I say how I, I, I told her about this story and I'm about um, Pigeon being um, this girl's mother who, who stays with her after she dies and, and my mother who was not uh, who at the time was not very vo verbal. Um, she had had a, a, some massive brain hemorrhages. And she she turned to me and said with surprising clarity, she said, Oh, you have to write that. Mm -hmm. And so I finally did. I wrote this book before my mom got sick. Mm -hmm. and my mom, um, I, there were about four years, my mom, I watched my mom die for about four years. It was pretty bad. And before, 10 days before she died, my sister died. And so there was a whole bunch of trauma, bam, bam, bam. I set mm -hmm. aside this book for a long time. I had started it, but then all this deep, dark stuff happened. And I, and I just couldn't write. I had no words. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was, it was, it was difficult, but there came a time when I wanted to get back into it when, you know, as grief does, it lessens, it never, you know, truly goes away. Mm -hmm. But um, I found that even though the story is basically the same storyline, um, what I had started out with, it ended up with such emotion and meaning and depth that I would not have put in it if had all this dark stuff hadn't happened, because it is about, you know, mother figures and mothers sticking around even after they pass away. It's about what do you do when you lose people and how to let go, how to move on. So it was, it was, it was a personal, personal journey for me. Um, Patty Ejayek, and I'm Patty, I hope I'm saying your last name properly. Um, she's asking specifically if your vision of the story changed when you went back to it. It didn't in terms of, uh, you know, I had I had the idea of ghosts and I had the idea of um, a, a lot of these characters. Most of these characters don't have great mother figures. I, I, I knew that from the beginning. I think um, because I lost my mom during that time and came back to it after I'd lost my mom, I think there's I think there's just a, there's more it's more nuanced than it would have been. Um, but I but I. I had the idea before my mom got sick and before my mom and sister died, but um, it's not the same book. It's the same structure. It's the same story, but it's not the same book I would have written before because I'm, I'm not the same person. Mm -hmm. So here's my question for both of you though. 
who believes in ghosts in for real and maybe you don't but i'm gonna ask i don't mm -hmm. but i i i think that there's connection to people who have passed but i don't know if that means to me that's not a kind of more visceral which is the wrong word type of ghost person or ghost figure but there's there's something there because you know when you've lost someone you have to feel that there's some sort of connection that you can kind of reach out to and and touch but I also think that's why to your point Sarah earlier connecting with that kind of first person narrative and being able to have that type of communication is like huge <laughs> right I hadn't thought about that that's very true I I I've never seen a ghost. I don't know. I can't. So I can't say from personal experience. I think my belief is my mom and my sister are somewhere that they're not here, but they are somewhere, somewhere I can't mm -hmm. see them, somewhere I can't hear them. Um, I, you know, I don't even see sparkles uh, in the corner of my eye or smell their perfume. I've, I've never had that sensation. I can't even dream of them, so, but they're not here, but I know they're not gone. They're somewhere. And that, and I think that just boils down to the idea of everything I want to com communicate in any book I've written is this sense of hope. And that sort of ties into that, the hope of the hereafter of seeing them again. I mean, I, I, that the end is not the end. Well, and I think ghosts are also stories. I mean, we connect with the people who came before us. Actually, my family has this incredibly ugly thing. It's so ugly, you guys. It's so ugly. It's like, a, it's, I guess it's like a I don't even know how to describe it, but it's an it's a memorial thing from members of our family from like the 1700s and the 1800s, mm -hmm. and it has this weeping willow on it. And I make fun of my cousin because it lives in her house now, and I'm like, that creepy thing lives with you. Like, what is going on? But I mean, these are our people. These are like our great great greats and our great great greats. But when I was a kid, the thing creeped. I, it's so it's one of those weird New England things. And when you grow up in New England, like, I mean, yeah, when you grow up in yeah. New England, you're <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's such an ugly, weird thing. And yet, when I think about all of the stories I know about family members and friends of the family and things that came before, someone always has a great story. And to me, that's the ghostly smudge. That's the thing where it's like, you know, someone's going to remember you. Someone's going to remember something about you. It may not be the thing you want, but it's going to be a thing. And I just, I love the idea, especially for Mac, like Camille is dusting him with, you know, corn, uh, corn flour. Mm -hmm. And it's because he can't let go. I mean, mm -hmm. we think, you know, a lot of the common sort of conventional wisdom is, I guess, the phrase I'm looking for about ghosts is they stick around because they've got unfinished business. And if you look certainly at Japanese and Chinese ghost mythology, like, yeah, they're sticking around and you super do not want them to stick around. Mm -hmm. But in this case, Camille's hanging out because Mac doesn't know how to let go and doesn't know how to move forward. And I thought that was a really beautiful touch. Yeah. I just, that was one of the nicest moments in the book where I'm like, yes, yeah, some of this is on us. Life doesn't just happen to us. We make choices and sometimes we don't always make the best choices, you know. Um, the aforementioned creepy art in my cousin's house. But um, still, I love the way you give your character space to be messy and to be real. Yeah. I mean, Charlotte, Okay, we got to talk about Charlotte. Charlotte and her very bad taste in men, one, mm -hmm. but also she has survived some stuff where I was like, oh my God, this poor girl. I mean, but I get her. Ready to run? Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. So when did Charlotte really become Charlotte? And when did Mac become Mac? And, you know, Charlotte's haunted in ways that, well, Mac is too. It's just a different kind of haunting. That's right, exactly. Um, Charlotte's character formed as I was writing her. Mm -hmm. I didn't know her backstory until um, I started writing her. Mm -hmm. And it, and and those of you who have read my books know that I don't delve very, very dark because that's not my voice and that's not how I write. But I do explore I, I look into I, I know there's a there's there's a darkness there's a void in there and I, and I never mm -hmm. deny that I but I think because I, I like to end on the idea of hope that mm -hmm. that um, maybe that dark doesn't seem as dark but people go through some hard stuff in life mm -hmm. and Charlotte is one of those and um, she uh, what I wanted to touch on with Charlotte was the idea of childhood trauma um, and how it affects every relationship you have as an adult and how hard it is to let go of something, even if it's a horrible something, something that defines you. 
And so I think that was Charlotte's journey of letting, because, you know, she even defined herself by not herself, but by, by the identity of a, her best friend who passed away. So um, in, in her letting go, um, she's letting go of really, you know, the 16 year old um, who her best friend who died. So that was her letting go. And that mm-hmm. was her ghost. I mean, she has this idea of witch balls. And I had the whole idea of Charlotte collecting witch balls was a much bigger element in an earlier draft of the book, but I sort of toned that down. But that was that was meant to be another of her connection with ghosts. Mm-hmm. Was there a decision you made in the, you know, the the breadth of your cast of characters in deciding the way each character was haunted? Did you think about the different ways first and then kind of create the character from there? Obviously, Zoe was first, but when you were building the rest of the of the condo, um, how did you a- approach kind of developing each of them? I didn't know what they were haunted by at first. They came first and then and then their pasts and, the, and, and their ghosts um, followed. And, and that is, that's just part of the frustrating, frustrating way I write is that I, I never have a clear path or a clear plot. It all, it just meanders. There's lots of deleting and tears and frustration. And then, and then I sort of end up with the book that it is. I've, I've said often that I am not a great writer, but I'm a pretty good rewriter. And that's when the magic comes <laughs> in. And that's when the, the, poetic language comes in. I just mm-hmm. need to get it down on the paper and see where I'm going. And so I didn't know, I didn't know what these characters were haunted by at first, just who they, just who they were. They just showed mm-hmm. up and then I started asking them questions. <laughs> so we've got a lot of folks, including Christine Sutherland, asking about which of your books has been your favorite to write and why. And I sort Ooh. of suspect that other birds might be in the lead at this moment, but I'm guessing it also changes with every book that you do. It, it, it does change and because there's, there's a point in every single book I've written where I think it's the worst thing I've ever written and hate it. And, and no, <laughs> um, I think, um, honestly, I think Garden Spells just because that was the easiest book I've ever written. The shortest book, I mean, it was, I wrote it in about four months and then spent about two months rewriting it. It, um, it was the book that made my career. Um, it was, it was an easy book and I, and I wonder if it was not the story, but because it was the time in my life where, you know, I wanted to be published, but it wasn't a job. And so there wasn't the amount of stress I put on myself with subsequent books. I wonder if that is, is part of it, but um, I, 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 I do love garden spells. I do think though, in terms of all my characters, I think some of the characters, I think Camille in particular is Camille is probably my favorite character. She's the bomb. Yeah, I really bomb. loved her. I really <laughs> loved her. Um, Lynn Allen is wondering what were the reading values you grew up with, and I'm guessing you just read everything you could get your hands on, much like Shannon and I did. It's true. It's true. I, you know, I was I was a reader as a kid. My dad was a big reader, and I remember mm-hmm. in our dining room there were bookshelves in our dining room, books and books and books and books. Dad was a big reader. Mm-hmm. Mom worked in an elementary school with kindergarten kids, so. Um, I always had picture books in the house and that mom was the one who read to me and my sister. Um, but I remember the readathons in school and I, there was always a book, but I was always a daydreamer too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think um, I, I, when it comes to writing, I think I, I have said this quote so often over the past couple of weeks and as reading is the inhale and writing is the exhale. And Mm -hmm. that is, I mean, you can't be a writer without being a reader. I I don't see how that could happen, but um, it's, you're exhaling everything you've consumed. um, If you, if you're a reader and you're writing different genres, it's it's sort of how my style came about is that it's not just all one genre. It's romance. It's a little magical realism. It's a little mystery. It's a little Southern fiction. It's everything I read comes Mm -hmm. out as right but yeah all my life I've been a reader yeah Yeah, and I think it's really important to stress that I don't think you can really be a writer without being a reader I I I don't see how you separate the two because both of them are an active act of connection and I say this all the time on the show and I'm sorry if I sound like a broken record but I'm kind of not because I say it all the time because I genuinely believe it which is I mean you're not just sitting around going la 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 I'm reading a story it's you're connecting with a world that isn't 
right in front of you. And right. you're connecting with characters you might not otherwise meet. You're connecting with worlds that might not otherwise exist or are just down the street. You'd, it's an active act of connecting with other human beings. And I think that can't be left behind. Like we can't not think about that. No, it's true. It's true. And it's, 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 um, it's the reason why no matter what you read science fiction, if it's set on another world, if it's set mm -hmm. down the street, we can still, still connect with it because it's so human. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's real emotion. There's a, the, a line in other birds about um, not everything has to be real to be true. Fiction may not be real, but fiction is very, very true sometimes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hey, Diane Wilkes is asking, you've been posting about family clothing on Instagram, and I think this is such a cute question. I wasn't, and I was like, oh, this is great. I'm, I was going to stick with craft for a second, but I have to ask this. So you've been posting about family clothing on Instagram and talking about it with your niece, and Diane's wondering how much of your niece is Zoe? Oh, my, well, my Zoe and my niece are the same age, actually. They're both 19. Mm -hmm. okay. And my niece started her freshman year in college. So they are very close in age. They mm -hmm. are. Now, any any um, sort of, as she was growing up, I would always side eye Hannah a lot um, to get mannerisms of, you know, veracity in, in her age. Mm -hmm. Devin in Lost Lake was the same age as Hannah was. And so was, there was a lot of um, Hannah in Devon in Lost Lake. But um, yeah, there, there was um, the letters I've been writing to my niece um, mm -hmm. because my mom and my sister both passed away. Um, Hannah, you know, is, is losing a lot of stories, um, uh, particularly because I've had to clean out mom's house. And right. um, I am finding all these clothes that would be, you know, she would have no idea why they were kept. So I'm, 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 I've been. I put these clothes on a mannequin and I take a picture of the mannequin and I, and I write a letter to Hannah about what the story behind the, the, the piece of clothing is. Sometimes they're embarrassing. Sometimes they're sentimental, but um, the, the last one I wrote this past Monday was um, I remembered my mom had a monkey hair jacket in 1980. She collected <laughs> clothes from the 1940s. Uh -huh. And um, I remember a monkey hair jacket. And I actually found a picture of her wearing this monkey hair jacket. <laughs> um, so this little story is like that. I think it's really important too. I mean, history isn't just what we read. It's, it's what we experience and what we remember. I mean, my mother had some fabulous outfits, but also my mother was, you know, <laughs> tiny. So I enjoy the pictures. <laughs> So here's another question, though, from Tammy Steele. She's wondering if there's a future for Mac and Charlotte. Yeah, I, I absolutely, I, I know they end up together. They, they, mm -hmm. they went through Yay. a lot of grief and they, they, <laughs> have, they, have, they have done their time. They needed to find each other and they did. And so in my mind, you know, they, it's not as if they live happily ever after because that's a mm -hmm. fallacy. They're, they're mm -hmm. going to have their troubles. I know that, but I see them together. I, I, I think they're, they're going to be it. I'm not sure about Zoe or um, Oliver. They're so young, but I think they need each other for right now, but Mac and Charlotte for sure. Well, that's good to know. And Hey, I'm just, I know I'm bouncing around a little bit, but there are really a lot of great questions and I'm trying to get to as many of them as possible. So, you know, we're just going to bounce around. Uh, Christina Lorenzen uh, said, all of your books are so unique. Where do you get your ideas for them from? And I know we've talked quite a lot about other birds, but let's let's talk about the backlist for a second because I'm seeing a lot of love for the backlist in uh -huh. the chat and I'm really appreciating it. So thank you all. And if you haven't dropped your favorite Sarah Addison Allen book title in the chat, I'd love to see it. So if you wouldn't uh -huh. mind, that would be very groovy. If you haven't done it already, that would be fun for us to check out. So I'm just gonna encourage everyone in the audience to do that. But in the meantime, we have Christina's question. So I'm gonna kick it back to you. So where where do my ideas come from? Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah, okay. Yep. Um, I think, I don't know. I was, I was on a podcast a couple of days ago in which I remembered a quote by author Meg Cabot who said when, when she gets asked that question that she always says she gets her ideas at Target. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that idea. I want to shop at that Target where I can get those ideas on sale <laughs> and just stock up. Um, I I I I start with a sense of place. I I always know that, mm -hmm. but you know, it's just seeing where it goes. The book I'm writing right now, um, I I have my the place and the characters, but I have no idea what kind of magic is going to happen around mm -hmm. the corner yet. Um, like I said, it's very frustrating. It just it just happens when I sit down and I get in the zone and I, mm -hmm. and I start asking, 
what if and I don't and I because you know, magical realism gives you that latitude of you can put an invisible bird in that story you can make it work if you make it real enough you know if, if you don't have to explain it but say here's this bird and and that well that's one of the great things about fiction and magical realism but it's just about sitting down and letting go while well, ask, ask asking what if and making a lot of mistakes and deleting a lot but it's getting that wheel turning I think that's what makes so many of your books this one included feel so special and so real where the characters feel like real people to me where I'm thinking about them mm -hmm. later and I'm like oh, I wonder how Mac's doing and then I'm like no oh, wait wait <laughs> and it is and I think it, it really shows where, you know, you don't think about the kind of labor of love and the different types of writers and authors that there are. And I know you said you don't you don't think you're a good writer, but you're a good rewriter. You're a good writer. <laughs> you are a great writer because the characters feel so organic and so much of that it, it comes across so real because of the kind of labor of love in it. So. And yeah. let's give Lucy her props for a second. I don't want us to get away from this conversation without talking about Lucy because, you yes. know, one, she's Lucy. Two, she's had a journey. Sarah, you put your characters through it. And Elizabeth certainly too. I mean, yeah. neither of them have had an easy go of it. But the way Lucy shows up, not just for Oliver, she shows up for <laughs> Charlotte and Mac and Zoe, she shows up. And I would not want to make her mad. Oh no, I would not want to make her mad. But what I really love too, is she knows, she knows if she gets hit in the face that she can take care of everyone else, but also to just go supine and be on the floor and let this person do that. And she's like, yeah, whatever, you can't, you can't hurt me. That's a very mama response. That's a mama bear response to the nth degree. And I'm so glad Lucy got that moment because I wasn't entirely sure where things were going to go for her. I wasn't, I, I had a moment where I was like, hmm, what's happening here? She, there, there was a, a little Easter egg dropped early in the, in the story about, um, I can't remember which character said it, said um, that Lucy was the Boo Radley of the Delaware. Oh, yes. And so oh, yes. Um, she, she was sort of, <laughs> sort of what happened in To Kill a Mockingbird. It mm -hmm. was, um, Lucy came and saved the day, but she is this, you know, can't be out in the world kind of person. She is, um, I think she, she understands what damage is within her and she doesn't want to, she's, she's afraid of, of what kind of damage she has mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she doesn't want to inflict it on Oliver or anyone else. But I think there is a mom and bear instinct that she absolutely um, um, called upon. But I think also because when she saw um, Charlotte slash uh, well charlotte's mother when when yeah, yeah. the vil villain came in i think she had a certain understanding of what this uh, that villain was about because she had that aspect to her mm -hmm. she had that past and i want to shout out ethel yarborough here she says um there were many times the themes of mothers and children were brought up where did the inspiration for these kinds of relationships and their experiences come from thank you for mentioning how mothers aren't perfect i still sound, found so much sympathy for elizabeth and paloma even Charlotte's parents, which I think is a really fair statement. And uh, I'd love to hear where you decided or how you decided that you were going to show the full dimension of, of this mother's relationship. Because, you know, sometimes people get treacly and sometimes they go in the opposite direction. You're like, oh, apparently you have a monster of a parent, but OK. Yeah, I think it's, it's looking through a lens of, of empathy, first and foremost, but mm -hmm. I, I was um, I came across a, a, a term that I'd never heard before called the father wound, that everyone mm -hmm. had a father wound. But I, I thought at the same time, I bet we all sort of have mother wounds. Mm -hmm. We're not perfect as people, and our parents certainly aren't, some worse than others. But ah, I think um, but the idea of delving into the backstories and understanding why they were the way they were, how they were, you know, they didn't, they didn't come out of the womb this way they were formed this way and at some point the cycle has to stop and I think for all of these characters um it is I mean with Oliver it stops with Zoe it stops um with Charlotte it stops that um with Mac it stops that mm -hmm. going back to that idea of childhood trauma is that you know at, at some point you say when when do I stop when when do I stop blaming when do I stop hurting 
it's it's the wound. Sometimes it doesn't heal completely, um, but sometimes you have to stop picking at it. And and ah, the blame game is a big one to play. My 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 own parents certainly had their issues as kids and I understand why they became the people they they were but I, one thing I, I will I will have to say in the defense of my mother and my father is that no they're not they're not they reflected in any way in other words um, <laughs> uh, they I, I I always I have always felt um love from my mom and mm -hmm. my dad and I I also knew that whatever their limitations they always loved me so it, it wasn't a reflection of how I was raised but um, I, I'm interested in the idea of the psychology of it and, and um, of backstories and characters and how hard it is to move on just that. And that's a theme that runs through the book as well, not just yeah. with parents, but also grief and which is something I have, I struggle with um, moving on from, from a wound, from a wound you think is not going to heal. And that's what grief feels like as well. But um, the idea of hope, we're coming back, you know, we're, we're dovetailing yep. on themes, the idea of hope that it doesn't always have to be this way. Mm -hmm. Change is possible, folks. It's totally possible. And Look at these hard. characters. It yeah, it's hard. hard. Of course yeah. it's hard. But, you know, a lot of the stuff that's worth doing is hard. Oh, it's the truth. I mean, yeah. uh, sometimes you just got to go through it to get to the other side, which I'm sorry to sound like a piece of weird inspirational wall art, but as, <laughs> someone, who tends, as someone who tends to lead with her chin and learn yeah. the hard way. <laughs> I'm saying sometimes you just got to go through it and be done with it. Hey, before we all go there, because I knew this was going to happen. I knew we were going to bump up hard against all sorts of time constraints, because I will say, though, this chat, watching the chat and watching people just drop so much love for all of your oh, books, Sarah, this is fabulous. And lots of folks saying, well, I've only read other birds and garden spells, but now I'm going to read everything else. And I'm so sorry your name flew by so fast that I but I think it began with an M. So um, thank you for that comment. That was very, very cute. I have to ask, though, what's next? Yeah, it feels good to get back into a sense of um, this is what normal is for me. You have a book that comes out mm -hmm. and you promote the book and then you write a new book and the new book comes out and I, I'm, I'm writing it right now. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting how stressful deadlines are, but, um, <laughs> um, but that's part of the process. Um, it is set in North Carolina and um, it takes place. Uh, well, I've been calling the marker on my, on my, the file is named Buttertown because that's the name of the town. So that's not, that's not going to be the name of the book, but um, it's a sister book and it takes place during a, the wettest summer on record in central North Carolina where secrets are uncovered. I would not quite fully grasp what those secrets are, but I like the idea of it. So that's where I am right now. Oh, that sounds can't so, wait. so good. <laughs> can't All right, listen. Wait. Before I let everyone go, though, I am going to shout out the night ship. We just announced our October book club pick. And Sarah, actually, I'm going to recommend it to you because this is right in your wheelhouse as a reader. It's parallel narratives. It's the 1600s. It's the 1980s. You will meet these two amazing children, Micah and Gil. And I cannot say if you like the big beating heart of a Sarah Addison Allen novel, you need to read the Night Ship by Jess Kidd. It is a treat. It is so fun. I will also say there's an episode of Poured Over up this morning with Jess Kidd, wherever, well, actually this afternoon, excuse me. Oh, I'm losing track of time. Um, <laughs> if you want to take a listen, it is a spoiler free conversation. Obviously, if you want to join us in November for an event just like this with Jess, who is very fun. And Sarah, I really hope you get to meet Jess in real life sometime. I just think you two would hit it off. You have very similar sensibilities. And I just think it would be a ball. And the idea that, you know, we can change and we can have hope and we can find our people and make our families. Right. That's something I think we could all use right about oh, now. Absolutely. So, thank you both for joining us, Shannon. It's always fun to see you, especially when I'm not down the hall from you. It's weird <laughs> when we're not just down the hall from each other. Sarah, thank you again. You are the bomb. I love your books. Thank and you. So obviously, much. everyone else here loves them too. Thank you, audience. And I hope we get to see you in November. Oh, thank day, you, everyone. everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.